this concept of advertise has really ingrained the uh, idea that um, communication is advertising, whereas communication is sharing. Episode 89. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm flexing the Zoom account yet again. I'm adhering to all the lockdown measures and not leaving the home, but don't worry, this will not stop us from connecting and talking with some of the best industry thought leaders and architects about how best to be growing our businesses and making positive of what is happening in the world at the moment. And I had a really great conversation uh, last week with Celeste Bolt, who is a media specialist and design enthusiast. Originally, she's from Melbourne in Australia, but now she's based in London. She's been on the show before um, when she was talking about Bowerbird, and she's actually the UK head of Bowerbird, which is a platform that connects designers and journalists and architects in order to see more great design projects getting published. So in this conversation, I ask Celeste some questions about how should practices be communicating during this crisis? What are the important things to be remembering? What are the differences between a small and a large firm? The importance of why marketing right now is absolutely critical and marketing isn't just sales you know communicating to our communities stepping into leadership and expressing that is a very important thing to be doing right now and also to be taking a step back and thinking about our ethos our vision what it is what is the messaging that we want to be using out in the world and crafting that precisely and carefully so sit back relax and enjoy Celeste Bolt. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Celeste, welcome back to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. In amongst all of this... uh this weird time. I guess it's a weird, everyone's saying unprecedented and strange, but it is just a bit weird, isn't it? This it time? is. It's like a, it's like a Christmas, but with dark undertones. <laughs> it was so strange. Um, you know, we've just had the Easter long weekend. It was so strange not seeing family for the first yeah. time. I think I didn't really feel the, the separation because my family's in Australia, but I guess until, until something like, and you know, a holiday comes along and you can't go see all your other expat friends. Um, you sort of maybe for me, it's been a bit easy to forget that I'm in isolation because I'm away from community anyway, sometimes. And how have you adapted to working from home? Oh, pretty well. I mean, so I work with Bowerbird and we're predominantly a remote team anyway. So um, it's been pretty easy for us to just sort of make the switch, I guess, with the lockdown laws in different regions where we're all spread across. Although I'm sad I've uh, had to leave my co-working space, which I just sort of really settled into. So definitely missing that. Great. Great. Well, a pleasure to have you back on the show as always. And today we're going to be talking about the importance of communicating in a crisis. And I think this is kind of questions that I've been getting a lot from architects messaging me and some of the clients that I'm working with, but just sort of trying to figure out the best way to be producing outbound messaging and 
the, the do's and don'ts of that. So I guess I think I w- wanted to kick off with, you said to me just now earlier before we started recording that communication doesn't necessarily equal sales or marketing yeah. doesn't equal you know, having to be sal- salesy. Can you, can you expand on that? Well, I think sort of what I, what I meant there was that, you know, a lot of the time when either I reach out to practices or meet new practices, they go, oh, we're, we never push sales. We, we're not a salesy practice when we never want to market ourselves. But really marketing isn't about, you know, saying, oh, you know, come and meet us for this consultation. We'll give you another one for free. It's not this, this sort of very, um, I guess, bottom line driven activity in that sense. Communication is everything that you do do and and everybody does actually do marketing and communications whether they um i guess consciously invest in it or not Mm. so um communication is everything from your brand it's the way that you answer the phone it's your logo it's your website it's your instagram it's everything that you say as your practice and really the thing that should underpin everything that you say is your your ethos so a lot of practices at the moment are saying to me what should we be saying and I think the best thing that you can do now is use this as a time of reflection. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of practices are going back to the drawing board and saying, you know, is the ethos or the, the messaging that we set out for ourselves the same as it was, you know, five or 10 years ago, has that changed? Is what we're communicating now still correlating with the kind of work that we're doing or the way that we've grown as a practice? So there's a lot of opportunities, I think, for people to go back and see what it actually is that they need to communicate before they actually start sharing that either online or, you know, with publications or, you know, either through like events, like digital events, like webinars. So lots of opportunities there. Um, I think it's really easy for us to confuse marketing and communications mm. because we, we tie those words together as a, as a function in practice. Um, but really that has so many different activities within it. You know, communications is what you're saying. Marketing is often about your bids and submissions and graphics. So lots of distinctions to make that I think maybe aren't so widely um, understood in architecture, which can often lead to a lot of confusion. What would be a kind of a practical way to audit your comms, if you like? How would you mm. suggest that a practice kind of goes about that reflection process? What, what sorts of things should they be looking at? I think language is a really big one. You know, are you speaking to your intended audience? Are you using technical language when you're talking about, you know, resi work in an interiors magazine? Probably incorrect. Um, You know, thinking about who's going to be reading this or who do you want to be reading this? Are they online at this time? Are they actually, is this the demographic that picks up that magazine in in the shops? Um, you know, if you're wanting to reach sort of higher end clients, you know, why are you getting published in the daily mail? You probably want to be going for something like the FT, looking at all of the avenues where you're, you're touching on and assessing if that actually reaches the kind of person that you would like to do work for. Um, I guess going back even, you know, a step further, how often do you post on social media? What's on your website? Is your photography up to date? When was the last time that you changed your staff page? All of these things um, that we so forget to do because, you know, when it comes to, you know, running a practice or, or working in architecture, unless you're the dedicated marketing person, marketing will never chase you. Mm. Comms will never chase you. All your clients will chase you. All your consultants will. But practice uh communications doesn't so i think now is a fantastic time to look at everything that you're doing it's interesting because i mean i often say to architects that you know we really should be spending at least 25 percent particularly if you're a small practice owner Mm -hmm. and you're doing everything at least 25 percent of your time should be done you know on prospecting and marketing and comms and communications and it doesn't really work either as if it's all kind of done in one clump it's a it's a consistent absolutely it has to be a consistent effort you know communications isn't about um we finished a project so let's share it it's the whole process that went into that and i think we can get so um i guess because we're so close to that that project throughout its life you know you design it you build it you photograph it you share it you know most of the time your audience hasn't seen it until the very last stages of that but for you it feels a bit overdone Mm -hmm. so I guess it's easy to sort of think oh I had that published once or we shared that on Instagram already we don't really need to keep sharing that 
but there's so much life that your projects can have after they're finished or even throughout their, their process. So looking at how much you're actually sharing of process is another, another thing to sort of analyze because we have so many opportunities to publish our own work now. You know, we've got social media and our websites and, and different channels and, and video is particularly uh, interesting too. Um, so I think that, you know, this ability to sort of bring people into to architecture and bring them closer to your projects as well is something that a lot of practices could really capitalize on. Well, that's an interesting one is this, the storytelling behind the process is often, for me as an architect, that's always the most interesting thing that I want to hear about an architect's journey or, or their story. But yet we rarely indulge in that, yeah. in sharing that. And actually for clients, it can be very useful and very powerful. I think what it does as well is it demystifies the process. You know, yeah. I, I speak to a lot of people who go, oh, I could never really, um, yeah, I probably wouldn't engage an architect. You know, I don't have that much money. But really it's that's an, an immediate misconception is that architecture is expensive. Well, no, it actually saves you a lot of money in the long term. Um, you know, I recently advised a friend on engaging an architect and sort of told him the benefits of, of how that would work and what that would do for his his budget overall. And he was quite impressed. Um, and Good work. On, Love it. Yeah, <laughs> pushing the profession forward. Love um, it. So, yeah, sharing process is about demystifying how architecture actually works. And we hear a lot of, um, you know, a lot of resi practices sort of say, oh, you know, working with that client was a headache or that was really difficult. And I think that also comes down to a lot of people don't yet know what the process is. And it's really important for practices to share that so that, you know, their clients are better educated when they come to them. They know what that process is going to be to work with them. They understand the expectations on their behalf as well, because really it's a, it's a partnership. Everyone's got to put the work in to get that project built. Um, yeah, I think I've probably got off topic so, here. But <laughs> no, that's, that's great. I, I'm going to go back a little bit as well, because you talked about ethos mm. and uh, for now's a good time for companies to kind of reassess what their ethos is. How, how do you make the bridge between, because sometimes a, a practice might have an ethos that is very architecturally driven or it's very design orientated or it's, there are certain strong architectural agendas, maybe sustainability, mm -hmm. maybe it's community, um, maybe it's a, a particular form of design that's of interest which kind of builds up part of a practice's ethos how do you build the bridge between that and say what a client's problems are so a client might have a very different idea maybe a client's not necessarily interested in sustainability or they don't realize the importance of sustainability how do you suggest that practices build that bridge of communication well i think it's about consistency um, you know, right. everything that you do with your messaging needs to say, really, it has to be underpinned by your, your key message, which really comes back to your ethos and how you work. So, you know, if you are a practice that focuses on um, maybe passive house um, projects in the north of the UK, um, always bring your comms back to that. Here's a project we did here. It's at this passive house standard. Here's a project we did here. It features this to meet, meet this sustainability standard. Always bringing back to the idea that, you know, you focus on that kind of work in that kind of space right. is really important. And I think clients begin to sort of engage with practices that meet their own ethos. You know, we look, as people, we look for, for what we recognise. You know, we look for the familiar elements. So I think a lot of... Um, you know, a lot of sort of higher end studios have higher end clients because there's maybe that sort of element of glitz or glamour or, um, yeah, I think a lot of us look for what we can connect with because then there's an inherent understanding that there's a shared sort of commonality and that makes the whole process easier. I think that's what gets people in the door really. Right. Is when they can see the, the human element behind a practice or behind a project and the way that that project was achieved, it allows them to sort of, you know, get to your website, call you up, you know, say we've got this project going on. You seem like a good fit. So ethos is really important. It needs to underpin all of your messaging as your practice because it's what connects you to your future clients. Yeah. And is communicating now during this, this unusual circumstances, this crisis that we're having at the moment, is now an important time to be communicating or is it something that we should 
Absolutely. Oh my goodness. You know, I've had a lot of practices come to me and say, oh, we, we, we need to, um, you know, sort of press pause for the moment and just not do anything for a few months. But, you know, we saw the same thing in 2008, any practice that suspended their communication or axed their marketing teams, they were not at front of mind when things picked up. Mm. And as you're doing research for your own, you know, business for the next, you know, six to 12 to, you know, however many months, um, future clients are doing the same thing. They're just planning. They're just holding back and going, who do I really want to work with? What's this project timeline going to look like? The clients are still there. They might not just be pressing go. So you really want to be front of mind when things pick back up again. It is such an important time to communicate. And it's an important time to communicate with empathy. So just yeah. understanding that people, you know, if you're pressing particularly, um, I guess, um, what I would say messages that have like a very um, clear call to action. So if you're really looking for people to book a consultation or, you know, send them, send in, you know, a brief that you could sort of you know, work with, um, you want to acknowledge that that work might not come about for the next few months and that's okay. I think just being a person is really important. Um, but, you know, on top of that, it's such an important time to share what you do and how you work because lots of people are at home. We're scrolling more. We're reading more. Um, we're looking around. We're researching. We've got a bit more time to sort of engage with maybe areas that we haven't been before when we've been so busy commuting or with work with kids or whatever. Um, so now is a really important time to communicate. And yeah, I think going back to what we sort of opened with, you know, communicating isn't always book a consultation, get one free. It's hi, this is how we work. This is who we are. This is what we like. That can mm. be just as valuable for getting people through the door in six months time. Yeah. And you were saying earlier, now's you know, one of the worst times to fire your comms teams. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think for a big practice, this is such a knee jerk reaction. You know, whenever um, we know it, whenever a practice is hit with hard times, the first expendable, um, I guess, function is always marketing and comms. And this comes down to a couple of things. Number one, comms is not valued nearly anywhere near as highly enough as it should be within architecture. It just yeah. isn't like, and I think this also comes from, you know, the historical relationship that architecture and communications has had, you know, up until the eighties architects couldn't advertise their services and this concept of advertise has really ingrained the uh, idea that um, communication is advertising whereas communication is sharing so whenever we hit um, you know hard times or there's a financial pinch a larger practice goes what overheads can we cut comms is always first but that team that manager, whatever the size of that function is, is so integral in getting you through the tight time. Mm. You need to constantly be communicating. You know, it's like, I think Dave Sharp actually sort of, you know, mentioned this idea to me and I've just held on to it ever since. And it was, um, you know, communications is like going to the gym. You can't do yo-yo marketing. It's like yo-yo dieting. It will just not work. You need to be consistent. And your comms team are smart professionals they're extremely strategic and they know how to get you through this time. You know, that's, it's their job and they're really, really good at it. But a lot of practices sort of um, go, well, what can we, what can we move first? You know, there's a, have a much, uh, you know, in uh, money and uh, um, salaries for, for a communications manager, but really that is your person. That's your, that's your, um, your life float, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting that this is that is such a knee jerk reaction in architecture. I'm sure it's the same in lots of other businesses as well. Um, that marketing is often seen as a, a you know an additional luxury to have, and actually, it's really not. It's it is so critical to the mm. engine of your business. It's like the fuel, um, and being able to to continually communicate and just deepen relationships with existing clients, potential new clients, and like you say communicating with that radical empathy understanding where people are at right now because there's a vast spectrum of you know what people are dealing with from quite extreme things of loss of family to uh, on the other end of things maybe some people are really enjoying the lockdown yeah. so it, it's just understanding where people are at and communicating in a in a sensitive but consistent manner and as you say your your comms team are the masters in this 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the comms teams need to be trusted more, I think. They are often, you know, marketing and communications is a whole profession on its own. It's not just this, um, what is often classed as business support function within a practice. You know, it's mm. not just, you know, you can't just get the grad to run the Instagram. And all of, all of um, you know, marketing and comms, everything from your website, your social media, your press, your events, any of your thought leadership, um, your branding, any graphics, bids, submissions, there is so much that goes into communications. And these specialisms have actually evolved as architecture has changed. You know, there are more architectural typologies. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more specialisms, so therefore there are way more stories to be told. And there are professionals that can tell these stories really, really effectively. Mm. Um, you know, first and foremost, architects are designers. You're not, you're not marketing professionals. And you need that help just as, you know, you, you buy software for your, your architect um, team to sort of, you know, work in CAD or Rhino or whatever. You need to, you know, support your um, comms team and your staff with the same trust and validation and tools that they need to do their job. So it's a really important time for studios to just double down on press and that can feel, or double down on communication, sorry, and that can feel really hard, but it is so valuable coming out the other side because you are the first practice whose phone will ring when things pick up. What sorts of comms, like specific things, do you think are good ideas for practices to be engaging with now? And is, and is press something that is still around? Can we still Absolutely. be doing that? Yep, press is still going. Um, a lot of magazines will be suffering uh, from loss of ad revenue as suppliers pull advertising budgets. So it's definitely worth being conscious that there's a bit more competition to get into magazines at the moment. Page space is tricky. But um, comms doesn't really work when you only pull on one string at a time. So you need to be pulling on multiple strings. You need to have your marketing mix organized. So your marketing mix is typically made up of the different activities that you do at any one time to create multiple touch points to bring these people back to you. So those, um, what's typically in a practices mix might be social media, it might be um, awards, um, thought leadership, and um, maybe let's say events. So events, that's when you're physically in the room shaking hands, your awards are what's being run. Oh, sorry, and press, of course, and press. Um, you need press to support all of the messaging that you publish yourself. So I've seen a couple of practices recently have really upped all of their social media activity, but their engagement hasn't changed because they've dropped press. So what that's doing is that is completely limiting their ability to reach new audiences, to reach new people, to capitalize on being published in new, uh, I guess, um, spaces on having people driven back to them. So you need all of these things to work in tandem. You can't just focus on one at a time. You've got to pull a couple of strings at different times um, because you need to make sure that what you share on your social media is being read by new people all the time to build that, that audience up. Therefore, you need press to be published and capitalize on other audiences to come back to you. And then you need that social media to feed back mm. to your website. So this, this is so good. This is so good what you're saying is like actually <laughs> using, because sometimes we think that social media, you can just do it by social media. But when, when you mix it with the press as well, that's how you can really grow uh, yeah. a large audience and kind of the two work in partnership together and not even you know it's not even about growing a large audience it's just about quality so mm. even if you post one thing a week instead of one thing a day like who cares about getting 10,000 followers you want a hundred people following you who are all going to prospectively hire yes. you so it's really really important that what you share is true to who you are as a practice but what you get published is with um, I guess new audiences that are going to be interested in what you do so if you're a sustainable resi specialist Let's look for sustainable um, focused publications. Passive House Plus, a great one. Um, get into local newspapers. You know, it's not just the archie press that we can, uh, you know, we all sort of have this misconception that getting published in Reba J and AJ is really fabulous. And you know what? They are great. They're really great for employer brand and they're really great for um, peer recognition. But are your future clients there? 
And that's a question that a lot of studios need to ask themselves mm -hmm. because every practice I ask, I say, where do you want to get published? And they always say Dezine or AJ or you know, Reba J. And that's fantastic. But there are a lot of other, other publications that have a lot more value. Um, so, you know, diversifying where you get published is super important as well. Could you go a bit more into that? That's really interesting about, yeah. about, about sort of alternative but very valuable publications that, that architects could be getting published in. Well, I think sort of something that's happened historically within architecture is that we've always looked to publish our, you know, design projects, you know, in front of our peers, in front of people who are going to understand the blood, sweat and tears that we put into this uh, project, right? Um, but really, we need to be communicating the value of architecture with people who are going to be commissioning it. So you know architecture has never really translated that well to to the public um, mainstream channels it's 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 typically very wordy it's very technical mm. and you know um you know i've just written an article that i got a great quote from a pr director from and she said you know everyone can name a famous musician artist or fashion designer why can no one uh, name a famous architect it's because we've always <laughs> seen ourselves as separate architecture has seen itself as separate from from the other arts which is so interesting right it's so interesting so um i guess coming back to this this concept of you know diversifying press um looking outside of architecture is the first first step so considering, you know, who is your, your target client? Who do you really want to work for? What are the kinds of projects that you want to do? Okay, where are those projects typically published? Let's have a look. Maybe it's on the Modern House. Maybe it's in, um, you know, the Right Move Journal, Daily Mail. I don't care. Look for those places. They mm -hmm. might not be sort of typical places that you think of when you think of architecture, but that is so valuable because there's not as much competition to get in front of those kinds of people or to get into those publications. So um, it's, it's about being, I guess, um, sort of thinking outside the box and yeah. definitely thinking outside architecture as well. Brilliant. And how does a platform like Bowerbird support? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, so, you know, we've been on the show before and um, sort of talked about how the platform works. And if anyone hasn't heard that episode, I would definitely go back and listen to it because it's with um, Ben and Nick, the two co-founders, and they explain the platform so well. I listened to that episode recently and I just thought, oh, they did such a good job. <laughs> um, so uh, Bowerbird is a platform that architects and journalists use. Architects upload their projects, send them out to journalists. On the other side, journalists log in each day and look for content to feature, either through the projects they've been sent by architects or through our sort of filterable database so for us it's about um, you know Ben and Nick really wanted to set up the platform to allow practices of all scale to get published um, typically publishing has been confined or restricted to uh, large practices with big budgets um, really and that only comes down to um, you know smaller studios don't have maybe the resources to hire a PR consultant or mm. agency but they don't also have the time to do it themselves. So Bowerbird fills that gap. Um, so it's software as a service that you can use to get published. Um, I guess on the other side of that, our mission is to see more architecture published more broadly. So coming back to this idea of diversifying where architecture is published. For us, it's not just about getting you into design or AJ. It's about going a bit further, you know, regional newspapers, um, TV channels, podcasts, radio shows. Um, we have a really interesting, um, uh, I guess it's a YouTube series, Never Too Small. They feature tiny houses or tiny spaces. So, yeah, getting more architecture out to more people is what we're trying to do. So we um, work with lots of architects across lots of different sizes. Brilliant. Love it. You said there as well that, you know, Bowerbird helps small and large practices. And that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, is there a difference at the moment between how large and small practices should be communicating? I mean, it's not necessarily about the difference in, I mean, I think there is a difference in size. For, for larger studios, they almost need to reassure their clients. I think the stakes can be a little higher depending on what budgets are in the, or projects are in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of bigger studios putting up messaging like we're still here, we're still working we're at home, but we're still at the same capacity. So I think a lot of reassurance there, but for smaller studios, actually it probably comes down to the same thing of we're still here. Um, 
I think big studios have an opportunity at the moment um, when a lot of their peers, unfortunately, will be, you know, reducing their marketing efforts and spend. That leaves a really clear path for savvy studios to get in there and get their work published and to, to actually do a good job um, in reaching the right clients and being quite strategic about that. Brilliant. Celeste, that's been absolutely fantastic thank you so much for your contribution this morning my pleasure Uh, my pleasure thank you that's been really great and that's a wrap thank you so much for listening and don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information i look forward to speaking with you the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.